Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Commute Coronavirus Update number 106. We'll talk about uh, whether we've really hit the plateau or not, uh, and also some comments about you know, amateur, amateur epidemiologists and misinformation, and some of the failures of our uh, booster campaign. So a uh, rundown of the numbers. So Lincoln, uh, we're kind of hovering between 120 and 140 hospitalizations. I think this is somewhat of an artificial cap and that we're just not taking in as many transfers as we could. There's certainly the demand for it, but we just don't have the space. Uh, stay, uh, Omaha, a little worse. Uh, they peaked at 104, or 452 uh, hospitalizations on Monday. This is the highest they've been for the whole pandemic. And again, it could be higher if they took in more transfers, uh, but they just basically hit capacity there as well. Uh, you know, so, some national headlines are saying they've plateaued and going down, but you have to realize you have to look at region by region. And in the New York, New Jersey, well, New York think the world thinks the world revolves around New York, uh, but you know they they are going down. But that's because they peaked a couple weeks ago. However, region by region, you're not seeing the same thing. So we can't just because the national numbers might be dropping because of the Northeast doesn't mean your region is dropping. Uh, I often pull up the Southeast because you know they said, oh well, we'll just let all the kids go to go to school without masks. We'll hit natural herd and we'll be done with this whole thing. And unfortunately, they got more hospitalizations again. So zero to 17 year old kids, they hit a higher rate than even the last one they did. Uh, same thing here uh, in our region. Uh, you know, hospitalizations are still on their way up, uh, including kids. Uh, you have to always be careful about this little dip at the end. A lot of times, that's not a true dip. That's reporting lag, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, I know this is probably not the case uh, for kids because Children's Hospital is full to the point that they're actually offloading uh, pediatric patients from Children's to non-pediatric hospitals uh, because they've hit capacity. So, for example, if you look at Bryan Medical Center's dashboard, uh, there are kids with COVID now here because they can't send them to children's, and children's actually, is anything, is sending them our way uh, because they've just hit capacity issues. And so the numbers are not dropping in Nebraska yet, although we certainly hope they will uh, drop in the near future. Uh, you know, from a staffing thing, for example, this is Lincoln Public Schools, which reports exclusions and positives for both staff and uh, uh, students. Uh, we may have peaked these last two weeks, and again, this dip at the end isn't true because uh, this is uh, an incomplete week. Uh, and so whenever you're looking at public health data, you always have to ask in the last one or two to th even three weeks, is that a true drop or is it just reporting lag? And that's the case here. However, it looks like 1253 down to 1208, there, that looks like a plateau. We'll find out by the end of the week whether this is really happening. Them. We have to wait to see. Uh, our sub rates are, aren't, aren't as uh, bad as they were, so uh, so hopefully we've hit a, hit a, hit a peak at least in, when it comes to school staffing and kids. So uh, I had this article sent to me, and so I usually don't go, I've kind of given up on trying to debunk some of the conspiracy theory folks out there, but uh, someone sent this to me and I thought it was worth responding because this is sort of a classic case uh, of uh, misreading the information. And so a couple things, this Daniel Horowitz, uh, he may be a good journalist, but if you look at his background, his background is an English major, and maybe I'm overgeneralizing here, but most English majors didn't take a lot of math in, in, in college and probably didn't take epidemiology and statistics either. And so his concerning data he's looking at, he's basically making what I would call a bunch of rookie mistakes because he just has, this is data he doesn't really understand that well. So one of the things he's saying about Scotland is that the case rates are actually worse in people who are vaccinated. That's his premise anyway. Well, if you look at the case rates, and I give, give them kudos for actually posting the raw data, which is nice, because then you can kind of look at it. But most of us are not looking at case rate data, and that's because of something called bias, which you always have to watch out for in epidemiology. Are these groups similar types of people doing the similar types of things? And the answer is no. The problem with people who are who, with using case rates is case rates are depending on, on a, did you test yourself, and B, did you report the test? And so uh, it could be that this number is lower because you know, vaccines don't work, but it could be because these people are A, not testing themselves, and then when they, a few times they do test them, they're not reporting. So most of us are not using case rates any, uh, to, to judge uh, magnitude anymore because of the wide variability in testing, testing behavior, uh, accessibility, all those things. And so we're really not looking at that anymore. So this is sort of not uh, highly skewed data you really shouldn't be focusing on to make that case. He does go on, though, to put hospital admissions, which is good. So he's using actual real data. Uh, and he does point out that this black and white number of people with two vaccinations is higher than this no vaccinations number. But what he misses is are, are, uh, the confidence intervals. So these are very low numerator, 174 out of a million. You got to be really careful interpreting an absolute number. And you really have to look, look at what's called the 95% confidence interval. This is kind of like when you hear an opinion poll and they'll say that this politician's you know, uh, polling at 52 and this one's 48%, but that's within the quote margin of error. That's exactly 
exactly what we were looking for. And it, the, the question you should ask when you look at this kind of data is do these confidence intervals overlap? Does 33 to, uh, to 54 overlap with 50 to 71? And the answer is yes. So the confidence intervals overlap. He's also cherry picking the data because although the two dose, that one number is uh, uh, maybe a red herring, what about the three dose number? Well, people have had their booster shot. It's not only quite a bit lower, it's statistically significant. Those confidence intervals don't overlap at all. So the three dose, uh, booster doses really, really can well against the unvaccinated, which kind of defeats this whole premise. Uh, the other thing you always have to be careful about, uh, which I talked about earlier and we'll, we'll hit, hit a little bit more, is you always have to worry about reporting lag the last couple weeks. So this last couple week data you have to be very careful about, whereas the, the three to four week old data is more accurate and you'll see that there is a nice stepwise decrease from uh, 34 down to 25 down to five. This is more complete data and probably more accurate and the confidence intervals uh, barely overlap and so uh, this is a better uh, use of data and really should be pulling this data in probably over two to three weeks because of the low numerators and denominators. If you look at death rates, same thing is happening. And so yes, this absolute number is a little higher, but he kind of neglects to mention over here the three dose sh rate showing that much, much lower rates and that the confidence interval levels no longer overlap when you're down in this area. Uh, so again, he's missing that. Uh, and so, you know, there's numerous examples of this. This is the excess death uh, section of the CDC website where you, uh, and this data goes back, you know, decades showing how many people in the United States die every year. Here's a bad flu year a couple of years back and you see a couple little blips here because we exceeded this threshold of more than expected deaths and it's typically seasonal, has been for decades. And then you see the pandemic and we've exceeded that threshold, you know, this entire pandemic by quite a bit here. And so that's why all these little pluses are here. That's statistically significantly higher. But again, you see this drop at the end. That's not a true drop. And if you actually go to the, the figure notes, they'll point that out, that there's uh, deaths, uh, there's reporting lags between when the death certificate is completed, when it's submitted, when it's processed. And so your last couple of weeks data is always gonna be a little off. You have to wait a little bit to have that, uh, the, those reporting lags clear out. You know, and the same thing, and the nice thing I like this is you can see state by state, and you see, of course, uh, Arizona and Florida. I point out those because Florida, you know, really, you know, they had two surges, thought they got the natural herd, and boy, did they have a huge surge in deaths this last one. And then Arizona is competing with Mississippi to be the worst state in the country. They've just got this ongoing uh, high hospitalization and death rate. They may cross and, and be the worst state in the, in the country uh, because of their lack of vaccinations. So, you know, here it is, you can go to this, and I've got the link to this, you can kind of look at everybody and how's everybody doing. They're at 352, getting pretty close to Mississippi's 360, and they're catching up. You know, New Jersey messed up really bad early on, but, you know, since hasn't been quite as bad. Uh, but boy, the South is, has, uh, really takes the cake for high mortality rates. And Nebraska actually doing pretty good uh, compared to its surrounding states, which I like to see, uh, mainly because of what's been done in Omaha and Lincoln. Uh, and then, of course, he finish, finishes off of Sweden, and I don't know why these people just keep going on and on about Sweden. And so they're missing a couple things. So, yes, Sweden did not do a full lockdown initially. Uh, they tried it, but then realized they probably over underdid it, unfortunately. And so they changed their model as they went. And so the, they still have this idea that Sweden never did any lockdowns, never did anything, which actually isn't true. Um, so if you look at the Swedish mortality data, they were initially actually one of the worst countries in the EU uh, and had pretty high rates. And what they did, they did start putting some things in place. And they also tried, uh, which I thought was actually an interesting strategy. They, their initial goal was to see if they can get the Swedish population to do these measures willingly and then not do a mandate. And they actually were able to get people to start doing enough that they actually did not, they had a possibility, a, a contingency plan to put mask ordinances and shut down in place, but they didn't do it. After the fact, they realized, you know what, boy, we got pretty high mortality rates. So they did start doing some shutdowns initially for schools, for example, later on. But then what they really did well is they got a lot of people vaccinated and boosted. And so their mortality really leveled off. And the countries who still just seem to be struggling with getting their act together uh, are just getting worse and worse. Uh, the UK hasn't done as bad lately. They're, they're, and we've, the reason they've kept it, uh, their deaths to a little minimum compared to us is because they did a really good job of boosting everybody where we did not. And that's the big problem we're running into. And if you're literally going to look at Sweden's comparison group, the comparison for Sweden should be at surrounding countries that are culturally similar or geography or close by and you'll notice that Denmark, Finland and Norway were far better than Sweden. So yes, doing some uh, lockdowns initially were helpful and then doing some other things that were put in place in these countries afterwards. So Sweden should not be the poster child of doing it right. They've, they've got kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, they haven't done as bad as us, but they, they could have done a lot better as well. 
And so the, the really it comes down to booster vaccines and Sweden's done much better than us. You know, you see the, the leading pack here and guess who's in the bottom of the pack, United States. We're hanging out with, you know, Brazil and Iran and Russia, unfortunately. We did a horrible job with our booster campaigns in the United States, unfortunately. And this is why our, our, our mortality and why we're passing so many other countries from a mortality standpoint. Uh, here in Nebraska, it's been frustrating to me that they, we haven't been posting this and tracking this data. So Ted and I went ahead and decided we'll just put it up live. So if you go to healthynebraska.org, uh, you have a visual where you can say where in Nebraska did people get two shots or three shots at the county level. So here in Lincoln, our 65 plus population, we got almost 75%, which is pretty good. And that's going to keep our mortality much lower than the rest of the state. But our overall population is only 34%. So we are not even in Lincoln, a quote, quote highly vaccinated community. Uh, and many of these uh, uh, states, uh, counties across the state, some of their, even their 65 plus is well under 50%, some as low as 16, 20, 25%. That's why our hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, and again, the Nebraska state is really conclusive that though boy, those vaccines work. Because remember, a lot of these people with no vaccination have had coronavirus once or twice, and they're still landing in hospital with higher rates than people who've had either two shots and three shots. It's still frustrating me that we should not be calling us fully vaccinated. It's a bureaucratic term locked in, into some bu bad bureaucratic decision making, in my opinion. We should be changing this to initial vaccination, not fully, and booster vaccinations to up to date. If we had more people up to date, we wouldn't be in this situation. But this just kind of adds to the communication failures of the CDC on down. Uh, so two shots is not fully vaccinated. I wish they would change that and hopefully they'll change it soon. Um, another way to look at things is if people are like, are saying, well, there's breakthrough, so maybe the vaccine doesn't work. Well, I think you have to keep, keep in mind that what, what's unique about Omicron versus measles, for example, you know, the real reason, the reason vaccinations work so well about measles is you've got layers of protection, both antibodies and memory B cells that need to kick in, but memory B cells take some time. And because measles is a 10 to 14 day incubation time, there's plenty of time for all this to happen. Whereas Omicron with a two to three day incubation uh, phase, you have to rely on almost on antibodies exclusively to prevent that initial infection. However, the memory B cells will kick in. And so maybe you got a quote breakthrough infection, you've got a runny nose and a slight headache, but it's good enough, the vaccinations that you prevent all those complications like pneumonias and hospitalizations and deaths. So it's not a failure that you got Omicron that, that the vaccine didn't work. And so you just have to think of things a little differently. The main focus of, of vaccinations is providing the top, preventing the top of the pyramid, deaths, hospitalizations, complications. The vaccinations are great at that. Uh, initially, with the slower incubation of, of the prayer variants, it was very good about any infection. Uh, Omicron is skipping that, so you're getting up to here. But the true reason for vaccination is preventing all of this. This is why we're in the crisis areas we are with our hospitals right now. Um, so lastly, we'll kind of finish up. I know there's some hope. I actually like this article by Ashish Jha because I think it's a very measured article about, you know, the worst of the Omicron is, well, it's probably passed in New York where, where on the East Coast where they are, but it will be, I think, in the next few weeks here, hopefully. The, the problem is that we may not follow UK trends because we've got such a low a number of people who, who had their booster. But he kind of goes through some, you know, what to look for in the future that, okay, once we get past this, let's really put in a plan this next time to actually get it right. I mean, how many times do we have to fail to put a plan in place? So he talks about the importance of getting a, a better testing system, better monitoring, making sure people understand masks, make sure we get better vaccinations. So I think it's worth your, we're, we're, we're reading it. Um, I think you know, there's a good chance that within a month or two, we could be uh, taking our masks off and things like that. And that's what he talks about. But we have to be ready for the next surge. Um, you know, we, we're, you know, why are we at this point? Uh, there's an article from your local epidemiologist that have, I'll put in there, but you know, why are we at this point? We're at the point where we're losing more Americans each day to COVID than we did in 9-11. Uh, we shouldn't be at this high of death rates. It's because of our failed booster campaign. We don't know for sure what the next variant is going to look like. Uh, one of the problems is the Omicron already has a subvariant with a lot more mutations already. Uh, so far, this subvariant doesn't look worse. It maybe is a little bit more infectious, but doesn't seem to be escaping any any any, fat, any more than the the, the the starting Omicron variant. Uh, but we're probably going to get more variants. Uh, we don't know for sure whether these are going to be worse or, or not. Uh, people are forgetting that, yeah, this is nice that this, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, has a mortality rate around 0.5%, but people are forgetting that SARS-CoV-1 had a mortality of 14 to 15%. There's nothing that's going to stop that from happening. We need to make sure that we're ready for that should it happen. Um, so new variants aren't destined to be milder, we hope they are, that what will make them milder isn't necessarily that the variant's milder, it's that we got enough immunity, hopefully primarily through vaccination, which is the best way to get it. 
So strategies in the place, he kind of talks uh, Shishigan like I talked about uh, late, late, later uh, in, the, in last week's episode. we got to focus on vaccinations, occasional masking when warranted. Right now we need it. Uh, I hope within a month or two we'll be able to take those masks off. We need better testing and outpatient treatment. We still have huge uh, supply shortages of, of our oral and, and uh, infusion medications. We're still not even caught up with that. We're going to have to talk, I think, in the future about better ventilation. There's a reason old hospitals uh, had open wards with uh, lots of opening windows. Uh, we're going to have to focus on better air exchanges and potentially MERV-13 air filters and better disease monitoring. So right now we're talking about a pandemic of the un- and under-vaccinated and the immunocompromised. And so if you're not fully vaccinated, which is really three doses, get your third dose as soon as possible. And for the rest of you who can't because you're immunocompromised too young, well, you vaccinate as many people around you and step up to a better mask, a KF94, a KN95, and N95, whichever one fits you the best, honestly. I, I use a KF94 because it fits my face best. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, this is what I do for a living, uh, but a disclaimer, it's my opinions, not necessarily these organizations, but this is how you can verify who I am and what I do.